This program is a video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. So I'm very happy to have Steve here tonight, as I say. Uh, so he is a park ranger and historian. Uh, he was at the Civil War Defenses of Washington. He's now at Camp Nelson, which, by the way, I think that's, you see the African-American troops in the background. That's because Camp Nelson indeed was a training ground for African-Americans. It was a supply depot. We had our Civil War uh, Trust or American Battlefield Trust Conference out in Kentucky a couple of years ago. We got to tour Camp Nelson, actually with Chris White and Gary Edelman. Uh, he's currently uh, serving as the uh, interpreter, as I said, at Camp Nel Nelson. He's also worked at Richmond, uh, Hopewell Cultural National Historical Park and Stones River, uh, Rock Creek Park and the Buffalo Soldiers, Na Soldiers National Monument. So he's been around. Military history scholar of the Civil War, Mr. Fan's research, he his research, focuses on military occupation, uh, operational command, and fortifications during the Civil War. He's the author of articles about Asians and Pacific Islanders in the Civil War and the defenses of Washington for numerous publications. He was nominated for the National Park Service Tilden Award for Excellence in Interpretation in 2019. And he holds a master's degree uh, in American history from Middle Tennessee State University. So uh, great gives me great pleasure, as I say, to present Steve Fan. I'm actually currently serving as the acting chief of interpretation at Camp Nelson National Monument, um, just outside of Lexington, Kentucky, one of the newest pa uh, Park Service units established in November of 2018. And by the way, my friends, there are earthworks here because I was out in the woods today looking at them. They're actually in pretty decent shape. If you ever make it out to Kentucky and want to check out the defenses of Camp Nelson and some of the really great Civil War sites around here, just please let me know. But we're really going to talk about the defenses of Washington, really dating back to 1861, um, all the way up until the post-Civil War period and kind of the aftermath and the preservation of the defenses as well, okay? So the origins, and I'll read this out loud. By the way, I found this uh, right before I left for Kentucky in mid-January. You see the date there, January 15th, 1861. And this is from the Alexandria Gazette and Virginia Advertiser and newspaper. And it says, Washington City, General, uh, General Winfield Scott is still engaged in making preparations to guard against a possible breach of peace in Washington, consequent on the present political agitation. Effective military forces are now to be posted in several parts of the city. It is not probable but that any but regular troops and militia of the district will be employed for this purpose. That's a very, very early date. And so when I say the defense of Washington, I really think back to the election of 1860, November of 1860, with obviously the very disputed election with four major candidates going to Abraham Lincoln and Hannibal um, Hamlin. And this is really gonna dramatically affect what happens in Washington. And what do I mean by that? Well, they're gonna need troops um, in the unprotected capital. That's the image of the unfinished um, capital dome. And this will lead back to Winfield Scott. Um, we know after the election that the president is not inaugurated until the following year. Um, and at that point, it was in March of 1861 that Abraham Lincoln would be inaugurated. So the idea was to make sure it happened. So James Buchanan is still um, the president of the United States. Um, and what's he going to do? Well, he's going to call on Winfield Scott, who's in New York, and he's going to call him, recall him to Washington. He's going to make his, his headquarters in D.C. And over the next few months, they're going to be planning the safe and peaceful transfer of power to Abraham Lincoln, uh, which does happen on March 3rd, 1861, but it's very tense. It's very tenuous. I found an incredible account of Winfield Scott literally uh, surrounded by his officers on the streets of Washington, making sure everything was secure. Uh, 
I found another account of uh, uh, federal uh, soldiers wearing civilian uniforms, walking through the crowd armed with pistols. Uh, there were cavalry vedettes roaming the streets, artillery pieces on the major avenues of approach to the city, uh, soldiers posted all over the area. But Abraham Lincoln was peacefully um, inaugurated as president in March of 1861. So really the uh, the origins of the defense of the Washington, I, I argue, start with the election and they're gonna evolve over the course of the war. And one of my major um, topics I talk about with the defenses is how much they do evolve over the Civil War. Um, even though they're earthworks and they seem static, they're actually not that static. They're going to grow and expand and evolve over the course of the conflict, okay? So, you know, initially there's gonna be federal troops and 90 day volunteers and militia in the city. They're rushing a regular army troops from the West, um, light artillery units as well to defend the Capitol. Uh, for those that live in Washington, we know that there was only one fortification around Fort Washington, about 10 or so miles south of the Capitol on the Maryland shore. That was it. There was no one else um, really to protect the Capitol. And um, DC is in a very precarious situation um, in regards to the geography. It's, you know, the city itself is in a bowl and it's surrounded by these heights, especially in Virginia, um, on the Eastern side, Maryland as well. And it's obviously a very tenuous situation. Which way is Maryland gonna go? Are they gonna secede from the Union and join the Confederacy? What about Virginia? This will dictate what happens with the defenses of Washington. Okay, so, Here's a map of Washington, D.C. during the Civil War. Uh, you're going to hear me talk about three different sections of the defenses of Washington. Obviously, we've got uh, Washington City, the capital there. Uh, we've got Maryland. We've got Virginia, obviously, the eastern section of Maryland as well, or part of the capital. And so what's going to happen? Well, it's going to be contingent on what happens with Virginia. Uh, and the War Department and the Army has been preparing for this in the weeks prior to Virginia's ordinance of secession, uh, there will be federal engineers and scouts riding around the Capitol and basically reporting on what they can do about defending the city. And this will happen on the evening of March 23rd, 1861, once the government realizes that Virginia will indeed leave the Union that evening, in three or four different columns, federal troops will cross the Potomac River and occupy Northern Virginia, including the Arlington House, the Robert E. Lee property. Uh, there will even be a force um, on water that will land in Alexandria, Virginia, right there at the bottom of the screen. And the very next day, the army will start erecting fortifications in Northern Virginia truly the beginning of the defenses of Washington. And the guy that's kind of in charge of this is uh, General Mansfield, killed at Antietam as we know. He's gonna be in command of the, the first iteration of the Department of Washington. Um, and he's gonna, he's an engineer and he's gonna have his officers, um, especially his engineers reconnoiter the ground around Washington. And he makes this suggestion to Winfield Scott, you basically need to seize the high ground. And so the army will cross the river, occupy the high ground because there's this elevated ground here. I'm sure everyone's been to Arlington National Cemetery. Simply from the front of the Lee property or the Arlington house, look north across the Potomac River and you can see the capital. That's what they were afraid of. The, uh, the secessionist forces, um, the Confederate army could roll up artillery and shell the capital. Uh, so federal forces will occupy Arlington and then Alexandria, and it will remain in federal hands for the remainder of the war. And joining him in Northern Virginia will be Irvin McDowell and the Army of Occupation, uh, soon to be known as the Army of Northeastern Virginia, uh, who will be fighting, uh, obviously, the first major battle at Manassas or Bull Run in July. But this is the beginning. Uh, they're going to erect about six or so forts in Northern Virginia. Uh, they're um, guarding all the approaches, especially the bridges, and I'll call them forward operating bases as well. They can move men and supplies across the river. 
because it's going to come down to him, obviously, to direct offensive operations in the field to defeat the Confederate Army to end the rebellion. And you can see that now from the Washington Evening Star um, from May 24th, the United States forces are now busily throwing on fortifications on the heights of the Virginia shore immediately, that quick. And you're going to see this image of, I believe, for New Jersey militia troops, 90-day guys um, with their havelocks, literally building fortifications. And uh, we'll talk about what that looks like, but it really is just an excavation. Uh, the men are going to cut down trees and start um, piling up dirt to build these temporary, very important to understand, temporary earthworks. And here's an image, a sketch of Fort Runyon, one of the, uh, actually the largest fort constructed as part of the defenses of Washington, um, present ground, uh, the Pentagon actually, uh, and it was there to protect Long Bridge, the really important um, crossing of the Potomac River uh, from Virginia into uh, the capital or Washington. Uh, a very cool, you can see a lot of historic images, by the way, image of Fort Ellsworth in Alexandria. It's kind of sitting right on top of the hill there. So you can see the army's going to come in, occupy strategic ground, especially high ground, uh, very important avenues of approach to the city um, to, in, to ensure its safety from uh, Virginia and then eventually Maryland as well. Um, and here's an example of a kind of early war fortification uh, Fort Corcoran, really in the center of the Arlington line. Uh, as I said, there's three major sectors, and we'll talk about that moving forward. And we'll talk about the design elements of these fortifications as well. Um, and I'm going to jump forward to really the next major evolution of the defenses of Washington. We know about the Battle of First Manassas or Bull Run. The Union Army is driven from the field back to the uh, defenses of Washington. There's literally an order from Winfield Scott telling the army to the retire to the protection of the fort's guns. So in a, in a way, the defenses of Washington had already served their purpose. But when McClellan arrives at the end of July of 1861, this is where everything really changes, where it becomes just a small few forts to a major system of fortifications protecting the capital. And man, he looks good in that image, doesn't he? So the art of fortification, well, he's gonna rely on this gentleman here, uh, General John G. Barnard, the, he's going to be the chief engineer. Actually, um, he, his story goes back to um, General Joseph K. Mansfield. He's um, serving as a major and chief engineer for General Mansfield. So he's going to be one of the officers reconnoitering the ground um, before the Army occupies Virginia in May of 1861. And he's going to be attached to uh, General McClellan's staff and he's going to be the chief engineer of the defenses of Washington, really until 1864. He'll spend a lot of time in the field with McClellan, especially during the Peninsula Campaign. But anytime there's a threat against the city, he is always recalled back to Washington to oversee the defenses of Washington. So let me give you an idea of what he was thinking in regards to building these defenses of Washington. And so listen to what he said. To meet the emergency, works were necessarily thrown up without that deliberate study of the topography on which the establishment of such a defensive line should, if practicable, be used. The first directions given to our laborers were to secure the roads, not merely as the beaten highways of travel from the country to the city, but as, in general, occupying the best ground for the enemy's approach. So one of the most important aspects of that statement from General Barnard is without deliberate study of the topography. So as he said, we built them you know, to cover major roads on high ground, strategic areas. Um, after the Maryland campaign in 1862 is when the army will go back to enhance the defenses of Washington. Very important to understand that. Okay, and so this is kind of a blown up image of soldiers you know, building earthworks. And so, um, as I said, it's important to understand these are temporary. Uh, these were mostly built on civilian property. Uh, as I said, the trees were cut down and soldiers just started excavating uh, dirt, piling up, building these walls under the watchful eye of federal engineers from the army and also civilian engineers as well, because it becomes such a um, large, uh, project, uh, and I'll talk about the number of forts as we move forward in the program. 
Okay, so I, I love using this kind of the side view and the bird's eye view of what the defenses of Washington look like. Um, and I love this first image really well. You can kind of, it's like cutting a cake in half or something. Uh, you got the parapet right here, the rampart. We'll talk about bomb proofs. Uh, you got the earthen ditch right there. When I talk to students, I ask them what's on the outside of a castle. And most of them can answer it's a moat. It's pretty much the same thing, a dry moat. Uh, the glossy is this little slope in the ground here, which protects the front of the fort. Uh, the abati, another school term I use, 19th century barbed wire, basically branches of wood facing the enemy to slow them down, okay? Uh, from the bird's eye point of view, an embrasure is where the cannon is being basically run out of the wall so they can fire from. Uh, bomb proof where the sh uh, sh uh, soldiers would take shelter, but there's also magazines as well. So a general idea of what these forts look like. And um, so in Northern Virginia, actually this is near the Metro station, there are remnant earthworks um, from Fort Lyon on, uh, on private property. So um, one thing I love about these sketches from the engineers is are, are all the forts look a little bit different because they sit on, um, you know, just um, varying degrees of slope and ground and things like that. So. Uh, the forts will be built for, to adhere to the ground they sit on. And here's a really great example of, of a very large fort, Fort Lyon in Northern Virginia. Uh, you got the Sally Port, the rear entrance. You have a couple magazines. By the way, one of these magazines does explode and kills a bunch of soldiers, I believe in 1862. Uh, the bomb proof centers in the middle of the fort where soldiers could take cover if they're under fire. Actually, there's three magazines here. I can't recall which one explodes. I think it's the closest one right here actually. All the different artillery pieces there. Uh, you can see that it literally says felled tree. That's the abati. So it gives you an idea of what these look like. And uh, the soldiers or engineers relied on the art of, uh, the art of uh, uh, excuse me, the art of fortification written by Dennis Mar Hart Mahan, the famous West Point instructor. Um, and this is what the forts were supposed to look like. Um, the profile of these forts consisted of earthen parapet from 12 to 18 feet thick. The thickness, depending on exposure, uh, the interior slope was rebedded while the exterior slope was allowed to take the natural slope of the earth. At the foot of the exterior slope proper, there was a narrow berm outside of which there was a ditch at least six feet deep. Um, outside of the ditch, the ground was graded so as to form a glossy with a narrow covered way fitted occasionally as an infantry parapet. At the glossy or at the foot, at its foot, there was usually built an abati. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, by the way, before that, uh, this is one of my favorite sketches from the defenses of Washington. So this is Fort Pennsylvania near Tenley Town. Uh, they, knew, they knew it as Fort Pennsylvania. We now know it as Fort Reno now. It was renamed Fort Reno during the Civil War. But you've got the main fort proper itself. Um, this is the highest point in Washington, D.C. I, I like to make this joke, by the way. It's about 300 feet above sea level. I'm from Colorado, so that's kind of funny to me, right? <laughs> so uh, that's not the highest point for me growing up. But this is the highest point in D.C. We'll be engaged in 1864. But I want everyone, if they can look closely, look at the explanation on the sides here. And so I describe this as Olympic Village in many ways. The soldiers do not live in the forts. All their structures are around the fort, mostly behind the fort or south of it. Um, from kitchens, and look at private's tent, quartermaster's sergeant, hospital, officer's stable, headquarters, uh, sutler's shop, small wooden shed. Everything was contained um, around these forts. I, I'm trying to recall the exact numbers, but I think uh, Fort Reno was about 80 acres of land quite a large installation there, okay? So it gives you an idea what went into building this fort. So a lot of obviously monetary investment and manpower as well. Okay, cause I know a lot of my friends that have been on my programs have seen this image before. Uh, this is uh, actually on present ground um, property owned by Catholic University of America. Uh, this is Fort Slumber in Northeast Washington, a relatively small size fort, but what a beauty, huh? So when we go back to talk about the profile of these forts, there's the parapet, this whole thing there, 12 to 18 feet thick. Uh, the ex interior slope, can, I mean the walls, can you see it right there? These are the wooden planking that they would 
uh, have up to basically reinforce the walls and stabilize them from crumbling or eroding. Uh, he talked about the uh, the berm is this little piece of earthwork on the outside of the scarp there, right over there. Here is the ditch. Pretty cool right there. Uh, the glossy would be kind of going downhill. It's probably better on the other side. And then obviously here's the abati. You got the soldiers marching through the sally port. So an absolutely spectacular image of the defenses of Washington and probably the best one, uh, I believe, to really show you all the key elements of the defenses of Washington. Okay, so uh, we know this is an early war image. Uh, my friend Robert Molesky, a local historian, discovered that this image was mislabeled. Um, this is near uh, Northeast DC as we're uh, near the Brooklyn neighborhood. Everyone can see the fort right on top of the hill here. This is actually Fort Bunker Hill, uh, a national park unit uh, managed by uh, Rock Creek Park. And we know this is an early war image because of the very large uh, Sibley tents sitting right there. And this will evolve as well, the quarters for the soldiers. I think a lot of people have seen this image. Uh, if nod your head if you have, very famous image of um, early war image, excuse me, 1861. Uh, I believe this is the 31st Pennsylvania or 82nd Pennsylvania moving forward. Um, and this is uh, near uh, Queens Farm, near uh, Fort Bunker Hill, um, 1861. An incredible image. You see uh, the gentleman with likely his wife and three children and even their sweet little dog right there. So early war image. Um, and there will be accounts of family members, including wives, joining their soldiers at the defenses of Washington. Uh, throughout the course of the war, but I wanted everyone to, to realize that, that this is a part of the defenses of Washington. And what's going to happen? Well, this will change. This is at Fort Stevens, uh, believed to be taken in 1865. Not bad, huh? You want to hang out there. If, hey, if you're in the middle of a civil war, I wouldn't mind having these quarters. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and these are some of the barracks occupied by um, buildings constructed um by the soldiers and um, civilian employees as well. And so you see how much the forts have evolved, including how the soldiers were housed from tents to these really great um, wooden barracks. Fort Stevens also included um, a hospital that was used by the sixth quarter in the battle of Fort Stevens in 1864. Uh, you know, like a mess hall, kitchen, all that there to service the soldiers. Okay, so the entire Circumference of the city was thus protected. So let me give you a number here. By the end of 1861, there are about 48 forts surrounding the capital. 48. That's quite the large number from the half dozen or so that um, was started really in May and June of 1861. Um, obviously, McClellan's in the process of organizing the Army of the Potomac. Okay, so. Uh, and so one of the questions I get quite a bit, who built the defenses of Washington? Well, the soldiers, the original members of the Army of the Potomac will be building these forts. When they leave for the Peninsula Campaign in 1862, you're gonna have other troops fall in, but also there's gonna be a lot of civilian employees. And also there's gonna be um, refugees, formerly enslaved African-Americans, really for a lot of them, mostly from Virginia, that are literally brought in by the War Department and who um, also just make their way to Washington, who will, who will be employed working on the defenses of Washington, okay? So 48 forts, several hundred pieces of artillery, and 48 is actually a pretty small number, and you'll see what I mean moving forward. Um, and so there's going to be additions to the fortifications as well. Uh, the forts themselves are built to about, about 800 to 1,000 yards apart. They can provide mutual artillery support to one another, and that will become very important during the Battle of Fort Stevens. I'll show you what that means. But I showed you that image before of Fort Reno or Fort Pennsylvania. There is the original fort right there at the bottom of the screen. The army will add the addition of Battery Reno as well. And a battery is really an unclosed artillery position. A lot of them were armed. Actually, um, excuse me, the majority of them were not armed with artillery. There were basically empty artillery platforms that could be armed uh, during uh, a battle or if there was a, you know, a raid or something on the city. Uh, Fort Reno was heavily armed, uh, including the battery. Um, they had a 100 pound Parrot rifle as well. And we'll talk about that moving forward. Um, so let me give you a good idea of what this looks like, okay? So you've got, 
you know, the Tennelly Town or Tennelly Town today, you've got the major fort itself, Fort Reno. You've got the battery Reno. And in between the forts, you have other batteries, okay? Battery Rossville and Battery Terrell. You have another small fort in the middle as well, Fort Kearney. You have another battery and another battery Smead. This is actually on the ground of Catholic, uh, St. John Catholic High School, College Catholic High School. And then Fort Jerusi. So you see between the gaps, uh, there will be connecting earthworks or rifle pits and also artillery batteries as well. So when McClellan says the entire circumference of the city was thus protected, that's exactly what he means by that. And I, another National Park Unit site um, near American University, uh, Battery Kimball. And this was mounted with two massive 100 pound Parrot rifles to protect Chain Bridge and the cr crossing of the Potomac River from Northern Virginia. I'm sure a lot of people have been out of this area before. Uh, the, uh, the earthworks are actually in very, very good condition. And I actually end my program with Battery Kimball and it's a special treat. So wait till you see it. Uh, and here's another battery for the people that have joined me uh, for my programs and tours in DC. Um, I want everyone to laugh at this because this is my favorite name of any installation in DC. By the way, you didn't want to have a fort named after you. Um, most likely you were uh, killed or mortally wounded or died of illness um, during the course of the Civil War. Um, this is called, wait for it, Battery to the Left of Rock Creek. I think they ran out of names or something here. But you see the embrasures, count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's in immaculate condition. So I most likely would believe that this uh, battery was unarmed um, and they could have likely filled it in with light artillery if the city was under a, a immediate threat or something like that. But look how well preserved this is, right? This is in the middle of Rock Creek Park. Most people walk by it every day, which is good for us for preservation reasons. But uh, there was this battery and two other batteries that protected Rock Creek Valley, east of Fort Jerusi, west of Fort Stevens. So if the Confederate Army made some sort of movement down Rock Creek, the little creek itself, they would run into literally a wicked crossfire of artillery. So that's what it looks like today, immaculate. And I think some people joined us for this one. Everyone can see the residents in the background there. This is near Rock Creek as well. Uh, this is actually west of the creek. This is east of Fort Reno. Uh, this is Battery Terrell. You can see the embrasures there for the cannons. The property, by the way, the Peruvian ambassador's residence in Washington, D.C. An absolutely incredible earthwork, very well preserved. Um, we had the great fortune um, through the Alliance to preserve the defenses of Washington, Loretta Newman, I'm sure a lot of you people know. She was able to connect uh, with, um, I think the State Department, to be honest, and then uh, the ambassador who's retired now and his wife were incredibly welcoming. Uh, they welcomed us obviously into the, um, their property where these earthworks are at. There's even connecting rifle pits off in this section over here. It would have connected to Fort Kearney actually and are in very good condition. Um, the Peruvian ambassador's uh, assistant told me that he signs all of his letters home of Battery Terrell, believe it or not. So very, very cool. Um, uh, obviously we have to get special permission to go out there, but hopefully we can do that um, sometime, maybe uh, this summer, we'll see what happens. Uh, there was also block houses as well, uh, mostly in Northern Virginia. Uh, built to really um, pr provide strength and necessary reinforcements, if I mean, men if needed, uh, to protect a railroad. And uh, being out west, I, you know, I studied the uh, uh, Middle Tennessee during the Civil War. Since there was so much more space, the Army built elaborate uh, blockhouses all throughout Middle Tennessee, Southern Tennessee. Um, I can't remember the exact number, maybe six or so blockhouses. Um, Actually, that number might be bigger, um, but just give you an idea of how fortified in every single aspect um, the city was from the roads, railroads, bridges, things like that. And of course, one of my favorite images, a cross chain bridge uh, near um, Northwest Washington, DC, of course, near American University, um, there was chain bridge. 
And if you wanted a cross chain bridge, you might run into a couple howitzers there. So they fortified the bridges as well. So as you can see, every single aspect of the defenses of Washington was really thought of by the engineers. And so one of my favorite images, uh, you can, if you were gonna make a dash across the bridge, you would be running into some hot lead there, okay? So let's talk about the defense itself. I'm gonna kind of move forward here. I know we're kind of running out of time. Um, so we talked about three main zones. So this is one zone here. They called it the Arlington line or the Arlington defenses, obviously the you know, around Arlington, well, we now know Arlington National Cemetery all the way down to um, Alexandria. What we have to the north here, what they call the Northern defenses along the Maryland border. And right across this section of the line here, they called it the Eastern branch defenses, Eastern branch of the, uh, of the, Anna, of the Potomac River uh, we obviously call it the Anacostia River now. So three main zones. The zone of immediate threat will be Virginia. That will change after the Maryland campaign in 1862 to the Maryland side. Um, and this is um, kind of the lightest zone um, on the eastern section of the city here. And so I found this on the Library of Congress and gives you a good idea of what the forts looked like shape-wise, right? We talked about how big Fort Runyon was. Obviously the the railroad went right through the middle of the fort there. It had to be very large. But as you see, each fort looks a little bit different, right? I think um, probably one of the most traditional looking fort is probably Fort Worth there. You see all those, um, those parallel walls and those bastions providing mutual support and things like that. But each one of the forts are shaped a little bit differently. The forts on the Virginia side, by the way, were much larger than the ones in um, Maryland uh, and, and then Maryland, okay? Um, so this is uh, Fort C.F. Smith, a very great view of Virginia from this side. Um, and this is managed by Arlington County. So there are remnant earthworks there and uh, they have a new visitor center as well. So go and check them out. But a good idea, you got the gun platform here, you got the embrasures, um, everything bent out of earth and wood. So this looks a lot like Fort Stevens because they have the, the wooden vertical posts there. Uh, those are the revetments, by the way. Uh, you would see either wooden vertical posts or wooden planking as well. Uh, this is Fort Richardson. You can see an early war image with the Sibley tents there. Uh, and this, this fort will be enlarged as well uh, in Arlington. Uh, this is Fort Marcy, right off the GW Parkway there. You can see a really great 30-pound 30, uh, 30 Parrot rifle there. Uh, tents in the back there. Um, one of the best preserved forts that we have in the National Park Service in D.C., uh, so let's talk about this re real quick. So look how much smaller these forts are, right? Uh, you will see the addition of the batteries. There's Fort Reno. Uh, Fort Totten has a battery as well, um, but relatively smaller. Uh, these forts will be uh, enhanced in 1863, uh, just in time for the Battle of Fort Stevens. And we'll see what, that, uh, what I mean by that. Um, th these are the forts uh, on the Anacostia side as well, okay? Of course, Fort Stevens there. And we'll be talking a lot more about this fort moving forward, obviously the center of the attack in July of 1864. This image was taken in 1865. Um, and you see the, the revetments there. You've got the embrasures and gun platforms. You've got, I mean, that's Silver Spring, Maryland, which is an incredible image of. And we'll be talking a lot about this moving forward, okay? Okay, one of my favorite images. You see this a lot. 100-pound uh, Parrot rifle at Fort Totten, gun number 13, uh, facing northwest. Why is it facing northwest? Well, it provides battery support to the 7th Street Road and Fort Stevens. And off to the west of Fort Stevens is Fort DeRussi. It also has a 100-pound Parrot rifle. So imagine that cross-section firing 100-pound shells. The Army will mount about 16 100-pound Parrot rifles in 1863 and 1864, which were really basically enhance the range of the defenses of Washington. So when Jubal Early advances towards DC, he will be taking fire from 100 pound Parrot rifles, uh, mostly at Fort Reno, Fort Jerusi, Fort Totten. I believe there was one at Fort Sumner as well. And another great image, uh, Fort Lincoln in Northeast uh, DC. And why do I love this image folks? you see the 100 pound parrot rifle sitting in the corner of the image here. So you can see this is a later war image, um, but you can see um, that they're not only expanding the size of the fort, they're adding um, 
heavier firepower as well. And here's a, a really great internal view of Fort, uh, uh, Fort Lincoln. And I haven't really broken down this image too much. You see a smaller artillery piece there. I think the 100 pound parrot rifle actually is right there. Uh, soldiers sending as a sentry right there. Kind of some of the inner structures. Uh, I'm thinking this is probably the bomb proof here where the soldiers could take. Uh, there's another soldier right there, actually. Very great, uh, really vivid image of the defenses of Washington. Okay, um, Fort Totten. Um, and you can see soldiers standing in front of the magazine here where, where they would have stored the ammunition. Uh, you can see the flagpole right there as well. And there we go. A very, this is the Sally Port. This is, um, we actually know where uh, this is, and I'll show you what this looks like at the end of the program here, okay? And by the way, um, this sign here, if you blow it up, it says keep off grass. So kind of hilarious, but it's kind of what we hope for today. Look how big the walls are, by the way. Um, but yeah, a lot of these um, forts were supposed to be sodded, by the way. So another layer of protection, mostly from erosion, rain, and things like that, they would sod uh, the parapets. All right, real quickly, I'll talk about the Eastern Branch Line across the Anacostia River. Um, you can see the sections all the way going down to Fort Grable and Fort Schneider, Fort Carroll, Fort Stanton, uh, relatively smaller forts. Uh, they weren't all interconnected with, um, uh, with rifle pits either. Uh, very important, right, by the way. The Giesboro Horse Depot, one of the largest horse depots uh, erected during the Civil War, and these will be supplying hundreds of thousands of horses for the Army of the Potomac during the course of the Civil War. Uh, here is Fort Carroll, and you can see the fort will evolve because they're going to add these bastions, which provides flanking fire to the front of the wall here, meaning if you attack the fort from this direction, you're taking fire from your fort and from the flank as well. So they add these bastions or bastionets um, after 1862. And there's an image of the massive horse depot uh, east of the Anacostia River. Okay, so this is General Barnard's response to uh, Lee's invasion of Maryland. Even the Northern Virginia campaign with, you know, uh, Second Manassas and Chantilly or Ox Hill as well. So uh, the, the engineers in Washington have to adjust to what's happening on the battlefield. And that's the reason why the defenses of Washington will evolve. They realize that the immediate threat is not coming from Virginia, but in Maryland, especially after General Lee crosses the Potomac River. We know about the battle at um, Antietam on September 17th, but the fear was if they defeat the Union Army, they could march directly south and attack the northern defenses or make their break through the city through the north. So they're going to start to enhance the defenses of Washington dramatically, okay? We talked about this. This is another image at Fort Totten. They're going to add 100-pound parrot rifles, about 16 of them. Um, they're going to expand the forts. A lot of people have been to Fort Stevens. The original fort is right here, Fort Massachusetts. They will add this entire section throughout the course of the war. So it doubles in size in many ways, and they add more artillery pieces as well. Just an example of how the defenses evolved during the course of the Civil War, okay? Um, they're gonna add river defenses as well. This is Battery Rogers outside of Alexandria. You see the Potomac River. Two of the, these are the largest guns they ever mounted in DC. 15 inch Rodman gun right there, a 200 pound parrot rifle, absolutely massive. Uh, these could penetrate ironclad gunships. That's why they're on the river. Across the river is Fort Foot, um, what General Barnard called model works. He believed by this was built in late 1863, by the way, or, or 1863. By this point, they had perfected earthwork building in the defenses of Washington. These were mounted with several uh, 15 inch Rodman guns and 200 pound parrot rifles. And I think some people have been out there. You've seen this gun. There's two of them out there. Look, pretty big, huh? 40 pound powder charge over a 300 pound projectile. Uh, these are the original barrels from the Civil War, by the way, or tubes. Uh, and we had these incredible brick magazines that they built at some of the forts, not all of them, only a few of them. Uh, this is at Fort Stanton, um, Southeast uh, Anacostia River and absolutely immaculate condition where they would have stored ammunition, powder, things like that. Okay, so that's what he meant by that. 
And let me, I'm going to move forward with this, but we're going to talk about expansion of the forts, Fort Mahan. And what I showed is, you see these right here? At the corners, they added these bastions to add um, more firing angles for the forts themselves. As I said, if you attack from one direction, you're taking fire from three different sides. The bastions will be added later in the war. So just an example of what this looked like. We already talked about Fort Carroll. Why is this important? Remember, this is what the original fort looked like. You see the shape there, kind of like a D. There's not that many sides. And look at the bastions they added all right there. So these are the original engineering blueprints from the army, by the way. And it's, you see it on it, what it says there, proposed alteration. And what do they do? I, you already seen this image, but they're going to add this bastion later on in the war. And we, uh, it's actually all gone now that this is a, a neighborhood in DC now. So let me move forward really quickly with um, the Battle of Fort Stevens early at the gates, because I know we're running out of time here. Obviously, Jubal Early is going to make this pretty incredible offensive raid towards Washington beginning in mid uh, June of 1864. It's going to end up outside of Washington uh, in July, a month later, and it's going to be uh, quite a campaign at, and it evolves to the Valley campaign of 1864. Um, eventually duking him against Philip Sheridan and all the battles that take place in the fall of that year as well. Okay. So, I love using this map. I think a lot of people have seen it. Uh, but the red lines you see are Early's movement from Richmond to Charlottesville, Lynchburg, Salem, and then he's going to advance down the valley towards the Potomac River there. Um, you know, Lee's pinned against Richmond and Petersburg, right? He's going to try to change the momentum here, uh, with, uh, hopefully draw uh, reinforcements from Grant away from Richmond and Petersburg, you know, cause some sort of stir up north if possible, and this will happen because there's supposed to be a Union Army under David Hunter outside of Lynchburg. When Early arrives there, David Hunter vacates the valley, completely takes off, and the valley is free for him to take, and he'll advance all the way up to Harper's Ferry. There's going to be a light engagement there, and then he'll cross the Potomac River around the 4th of July, and you know he's going to be basically raiding cities and ransoming cities and things like that, or towns, uh, leading up to the Battle of Monocacy, and, and I have another iteration of this map, so um, just, um, just wait a second. Uh, but the blue lines we'll use, you'll, you're, you'll see are reinforcements being sent up, not only to Washington, but Baltimore as well. So mid-June to mid-July, okay? So we talked about federal armies in his path, David Hunter. When David Hunter vacates the valley with the Army of West Virginia, it's, it's going to be it's going to cause a major crisis among the federal high command because he's supposed to remain in the valley and threaten Richmond from the rear. He leaves. Um, there are troops under Franz Siegel at Harper's Ferry. I actually, you know, if you talk to uh, historians like Dennis Fry, he believes that Franz Siegel actually did pretty well, you know, kind of slowing down Juba early by a full day, uh, allowing troops to go up to Maryland and DC as well. And then sweet Lou Wallace, a lot of people know about Lou Wallace, of course, at Shiloh and, um, you know, his Ben-Hur and things like that. But this is going to be his, you know, his really defining moment of the Civil War where he um, kind of redeems his honor in many ways after what happened at Shiloh. And so, you know, Grant and Lincoln see this as an opportunity to isolate this Confederate force away from Lee, especially north of the Potomac River, and hopefully destroy it before I can get back um, and cause more mischief or reunite with Robert E. Lee. So that's kind of the thinking amongst some of the commanders, including Grant. Um, others um, are kind of freaking out and don't really know what to do other than recall troops back to Washington, okay? So back to this map, it becomes a race to see who will get to DC um, by you know, the 7th or so of July. Grant realizes what's going on and he's gonna send reinforcements by water taxi, troop transports up the Chesapeake Bay. Um, the first troops will be the third division of the sixth Corps. I'm all about animation here, my friends, check this out. Under James Ricketts, he's gonna go all the way to Baltimore and they're gonna move him by train after Frederick and he's gonna fight at Monocacy with about 2,500 or so troops, veteran soldiers, um, he'll provide the backbone to Lew Wallace's defense on July 9th. 
Um, and that's the reason why Lou Wallace is able to hold on for about eight hours. The fight of the six, uh, third division of the Sixth Corps. Uh, the re remaining two divisions will be sent up directly to Washington. Uh, they arrive on July 11th as um, Jubal Early is advancing towards the city. And there's also elements of the 19th Corps. They're coming from the Department of the Gulf. They're supposed to reinforce Grant at Petersburg. Uh, they're already on uh, troop transports. They're sent up to DC as well. It's gonna take a couple weeks before really any large numbers of the 19th Corps arrive to reinforce uh, the capital and the forces in the field, okay? And so you will have to use every exertion to save Lou Baltimore and Washington. So Lou Wall sends this cable to Washington. I have the time here, 11.40 p.m. on July 9th after the Battle of Monocacy. He literally says, I fought the enemy at Frederick Junction from 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. When they overwhelmed me with numbers, I am retreating with a foot sore, battered, and half demoralized column. Forces of the enemy at least 20,000. Uh, it's probably about half that number. You will have to use every exertion to save Baltimore and Washington. And this is important. Very, very important. I, I think the troops of the Sixth Corps fought magnificently. And why is that important? Because Lou, um, excuse me, Jubal Early realizes that, uh, that the Army of the Potomac is somewhere around him, right? He does not know how many reinforcements are being sent to Washington or the area, but he knows that he has to make a dash towards Washington as quickly as possible. So we know that, now know this is the battle that saved Washington, um, another National Park unit. Um, as John was saying, we did a really great program out here with um, our good friend uh, who recently passed away, Ed Bars. May he rest in peace. Um, that was back in 2017. Um, but this will slow down the Confederate Army by one full day. The following day, July 10th, Jubal Early will advance towards Washington. It's about a 40-mile march. He doesn't get there. Uh, it's hot. It's humid. His men are pretty spent from their campaign. This pretty epic fight on July 9th as well. But he pushes his men as, as hard as he can to Washington. And they'll arrive outside the gates of Washington on the um, really around the afternoon of July 11th. Okay. Um, kind of a, a, a map of the battle here. So Lou Walsh retreats to Baltimore, by the way. He does not retreat to Washington. All right. So I'm going to push forward here. I know we have a lot to do. Um, um, let get through before the end of the program, but this kind of shows you the map of the Confederate Army advancing towards um, DC. And you can see Dribble Early is talking about how it was excessively hot very early in the morning. There was dust. Apparently, his infantry columns were strung up for about 10 miles. Um, some of his cavalry under John McClausen's will advance down the Wisconsin Avenue towards really Tenley Town. Uh, they're going to run into the forts around Fort Reno and troops around that area. Uh, his other troops will advance towards Silver Spring and march directly down uh, Georgia Avenue or the 7th Street Road towards Fort Stevens. And why is Fort Reno so important? Well, you can see it right here. The Rockville Road is where McClausen's coming down. Um, most of the infantry will be coming down the 7th Street Road because uh, Fort Reno has this large signal tower and they can see the Confederate columns coming from like Rockville. And they have a 100-pound Parrot rifle, and they'll be firing sh shells three miles out, um, yeah, basically letting the Confederate advance know that we see you guys. We're going to slow you down as much as possible. Uh, so there's going to be some skirmishing on this side of, um, of Rock Creek to the, to the left or, or the west, light skirmishing with cav cavalry and infantry pickets and things like that. But the focal point will be the 7th Street Road with Early's infantry, okay? And you can see that number there. The end of the, I call this the high water mark um, of the Battle of Fort Stevens, 110 yards. And this is what the messenger from Fort uh, Stevens says to Army headquarters. Uh, by that point, by the way, the, the, the first and second division of the Sixth Corps had to ride up the Potomac River and will be marched up north to reinforce the beleaguered front lines. Okay. Uh, you can see the Seventh Street Road is right there. The Confederate armies are marching down this exact road. We now know it as Georgia Avenue. Uh, as I said, they'll get within about 100 yards before reinforcements, um, actually from within the defenses of Washington, push them back. And by that evening, the Sixth Corps will fill in the line, and Early has no chance of really breaking through them um, to the um, into the Capitol. Okay, 
I'm going to move through this real quick. We talked about Fort Stevens. We talked about earliest high a high water mark. As you see, the six cores moving up. Uh, and, and, uh, according to uh, Dr. Benjamin Franklin uh, Cooling, you know the preeminent expert on the defenses of Washington with Wally Owen, um, you know author of Mr. Lincoln's Forts. He says the main sector of fighting is from Fort Jerusi to Fort Slocum. I completely agree with that. Um, that's where the, um, the majority of Early's infantry will be located on both sides of Georgia Avenue, uh, obviously directly towards Fort Stevens. But as I said, there's a 100 pound parrot rifle at Fort Taunton. There's one at Fort Jerusi. Uh, Fort Slocum's firing at these troops. So they're all taking fire from multiple forts and obviously uh, fire from Fort Stevens as well. As I said, 100 pound par uh, parrot rifle from Fort Taunton's in action. Uh, and this is uh, the famous kind of evening of July 11th. He has the Council of War at Montgomery um, Blair's property in, uh, up in um, Silver Spring, Maryland. And they, th he said, I'm gonna ride out the next day. And, and I found the troops line, uh, you know, the parapet line of troops. Um, his opportunity to take Washington is over, okay? Um, let me conclude it really quick. The battle ends on July 12th. We know Abraham Lincoln, we believe, actually, is there on both days, July 11th and 12th. Uh, the most famous incident, of course, being on July 12th, when he's escorted to the front of the fort by General Horatio Wright. Uh, and a surgeon from a Pennsylvania regiment is standing next to him. He gets wounded, getting carried off there. And someone yells to the president to get down. Get down, you fool. Get down, you damn fool. There's about... 18 or so witnesses that claim to have told Lincoln to get down, you fool, of course. And Lincoln was removed from the fort and sent back to the White House, thus ending his participation in the Battle of Fort Stevens. But by the way, the battle does not end, okay? Um, the Confederate forces hang around the area by near uh, modern day Walter Reed National Medical Center. So on the evening around six o'clock, uh, two brigades of the Union Sixth Corps under General Frank Wheaton they actually renamed the city of Leesboro after Frank Wheaton after the Civil War. We now know it as Wheaton, Maryland today. They launched their frontal assault, uh, the brigades of Bidwell and Edwards. They're gonna run into um, um, pretty heavy um, resistance from the Confederate army who were basically recover, um, um, trying to protect a retreat back in uh, into Maryland, uh, mostly Robert Rhodes' division. Uh, so there's gonna be a fighting um, retreat. There's gonna be a pretty heavy escalated firefight. By the way, the majority of the casualties will take place during this action between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. on the evening of July 12, 1864, ending the Battle of Fort Stevens. You see my office is right there, Battleground National Cemetery. So Battleground really is a, a battlefield. And I'll, I'll show you images of that today, okay? And here's a really good um, image by my friend, Ed, uh, Matt, by Edward Alexander talking about the fight um, on both sides of Georgia Avenue there, okay? Okay, let's move forward here. So let's talk about the end of the Civil War. Uh, they keep about 20 forts around until 1866. They classify them as first, second, or third class forts. First cla uh, class meant they were active. So they kept those forts active with their artillery, with garrisons. Uh, second class was um, basically put on, um, put on reserve just in case. The majority of the forts were third class. Um, they were dismantled. They took all the guns out and the army auctioned off all the property you see in the forts, mostly the wood, things like that. In um, the November of 1865, actually, you'll see uh, the government's trying to, re, you know, kind of refill the coffers by auctioning off all this property. And what's gonna happen? Well, well, when you take the revetments out and all the wooden planking and stuff like that, the walls will erode. Uh, the trees will grow back. Uh, this is a really great image of the early 1900s, at least 1911, uh, at Fort Stevens. Look how much Fort Stevens had really eroded since the Civil War. Why do we know that? Well, that boulder was taken off the battlefield and was dedicated in 1911, November 1911. So we can really date this around that period. A uh, famous image of Elizabeth Proctor Thomas, the African-American woman, and, and her family who owned property at Fort Stevens. Um, she's gonna sell off portions of her land to um, formerly enslaved people after the war. Um, the, the, um, the neighborhood of Brightwood will really develop after the Civil War. She's also gonna sell off a portion of her land to this gentleman right here, uh, this historian um, 
who names I completely laughed right now. I, I've written about him on the Civil War Defenses of Washington Facebook page, but he's going to form um, an organization to, to create the, a battlefield park, okay? He writes also a really short book about the battlefield, about the battle um, at Fort Stevens as well. Uh, so this is 1911, Union and Confederate Veterans. Um, and so this is really the first um, preservation efforts really with Fort Stevens. And then as we know, if a lot of you have visited, FDR, CCC, 1930s, Great Depression, uh, the, the fort was rebuilt in 1930 and, and 37, 1938. And that, that's what we have here today. Uh, they're using actually these cement kind of facsimiles uh, of these wooden posts, but they've really held up well over the past almost century. Okay, so this is one of my favorite aspects that I've been doing research on. And I'm sure a lot of you been in DC have seen the signs for the roads, Fort Drive, Fort Drive Park, Fort Circle Parks. This goes back to this period, okay? This is the legacy. I found this map in the Washington Evening Star in 1896, okay? And you see this line here, Fort Reno right there. The idea for Jerusi, Fort Stevens, was to create what they called Fort Drive, this boulevard around the city where, you know, the citizens could take their buggies out and carriages and enjoy history in nature. They wanted to make it like a boulevard that you would see in Europe, okay? So they called it Fort Drive and it really kind of evolved over the next several decades actually, but the biggest issue was funding and, and obviously the growth uh, urban development of the city as well. So obviously you're gonna have the great uh, World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, and then after the 1950s, the growth of the city, there was really uh, no way to make this grand boulevard around the city. That said, in the 1930s, the federal government started acquiring properties to potentially obviously build this Fort Drive. Uh, there's not one road that fully connects all the forts today, but the legacy is actually still there. The footprint is still there. And let me show you this. You're going to really appreciate this. See everything in blue? Those are managed by the National Park Service. Does that look like Fort Drive to you? Looks like Fort Drive to me, right? Pretty cool right there. So uh, as I said, really in the 1930s, you're going to see the Park Service acquire a lot of these lands and properties to one day build this grand boulevard around the Capitol. It never really comes to full fruition, but the, the legacy is there. Really, the structure of it is still there. Um, as we know, driving through uh, DC, there's not one road that takes you anywhere, right? You're going to take a little uh, side road here and side road there. But I love seeing this from 1896 to what we have here today. Uh, as I mentioned, Fort Eaton Allen and Fort C.F. Smith are managed by Arlington County Parks and Rec. There's a brand new visitor center at Fort C.F. Smith open on the weekends. Check out their website. And obviously, I think a lot of people have been to Fort Ward. Um, the best recreated um, earthworks, of course, a really great museum. Um, and they got the best resource uh, research collection as well, if you ever want to uh, do research on the defenses of Washington and Washington and Virginia during the Civil War. Okay, so really quickly, this is where I'm going to end it, friends. What happens here today? Well, we also, actually, you see the magazine right there. Uh, we do uh, events at Fort Stevens, obviously the uh, annual commemoration in July um, of 18, uh, uh, excuse me, July every year. Here's the National Cem uh, Cemetery. I do programming there quite often. Um, one of the smallest national cemeteries in the country. All the soldiers are from the Battle of Fort Stevens and one veteran. Um, if you have more questions, I can answer um, about the cemetery. Uh, sometimes I get dressed up and go play with the, you know, uh, do education programs with the students and kids and, and groups and things like that. So we do a lot of programming uh, in DC and uh, around the region as well. Um, I know a lot of people had mentioned they had been on my programs. I do a lot of, especially fall winter programs. Um, this is at Fort Jerusi. You can see the earthworks in the background. A lot of public programming, of course. Um, a lot of teacher workshops and things like that. So, you know, I, I try to, we try to connect um, the public as much as we can to um, these really great cultural resources and everything that happened there and obviously stuff moving forward as well. Uh, we have our commemoration that said every year with our um, reenactors and living historians. Uh, we have interns 
every year as well. And so it's, you know, we're, we're trying to connect and inspire the next generation to care for these places. Um, as you can see, we have uh, artillery, dem uh, you know, musket demonstrations, obviously. And by the way, I've, I've really tried to expand the defense of Washington beyond just the fourth, uh, the earthworks. Uh, the Park Service manages so many Civil War sites in Washington, D.C., as we all know. I'm sure a lot of people have been to Logan Circle before. Um, let me go back real quick. Um, a, a great monument to General Logan, 15th Corps, uh, Grand Army of the Rep uh, Republic president. Um, you know, he, his property is actually right across the street there, or his old property was. Uh, but during the Civil War, there was an encampment here called um, Camp Barker. And it was for U.S. CAV. And then it, it became a refugee camp for enslaved African-Americans. So that was, uh, I, this was one of my history at Sunset programs, a way to get people out into the, um, these really great spaces and talk about their, their rich history here. And we ended the program at the African-American Civil War Memorial near U Street. Um, the memorial itself is actually managed by the National Park Service. Uh, the African-American Civil War Museum is right across the street. Uh, it was such a DC program because the second the program ended, everyone jumped on the Metro and went home. It was really, it was really funny to see. Uh, but these are the type of programs that I, I've been trying to do around Washington. Um, we did a history at sunset. You can see there at Fort Stevens. We talked about um, African-American refugees from uh, you know, enslaved people coming into federal lines, right? So there's so many different stories we can talk about. If you're lucky, you can meet President Lincoln. You can tell him to get down, you fool yourself. You know, he, he, he tends to make an appearance usually every July, okay? And uh, we've been doing a lot of then and now images. So we saw that image before of the 3rd Pennsylvania, um, excuse me, 3rd Massachusetts Heavy Artillery from 1865. And this is what it would have looked like during the war, we believe, um, as lined up um, as closely as possible. Here's my favorite image, by the way. I think you can see why. You saw the image of Fort Totten Sally Port before. Look how much it's overgrown since then, okay? So I call this natural reclamation. Mother Nature will win these battles, right? Especially these are earthworks. Look how much the walls have eroded. The trees have gone back through. Um, obviously there's invasive plant species and ivy and things like that, but this is a way for people to really understand what these, this looked, back, looked like 150 years ago. Okay, so I added this to the PowerPoint today. This image was taken from a, a book published in 1975. There's Battery Kimball, my friends. You see the, the parapet there, the earthworks where they would have mounted the 200 pound parrot wife. What's important about this image? This rock with the plaque, okay? Because when I found the rock or a boulder, the plaque was gone. Um, and you can see the four points where it was, it was basically hammered into the ground. Uh, and if you look closely, you can see where the bolts had been broken off. So we have these really great uh, bronze markers at a lot of our forts. Uh, Fort Reno, Fort DeRussi, Fort Totten has one, Fort Bunker Hill has one, and some of the forts in the Southeast DC. I spent months doing research, going to uh, the Museum Resource Center in Hyattsville to, to see if we could find the text or, or, if we, or if we can find a better image to read the text. There was no image that I could find that existed. So we wrote one up. At, this is, I, I created the text for this. We installed this at the end of 2020, one of my proudest moments. So we have replaced the missing plaque you can see the Rock Creek Park maintenance crew. You can still see the earthworks in the background. We've done some restoration here. And you'll appreciate this one, which I'll end the program on. Pretty cool right there, huh? So we're trying to you know, bring attention back. We're trying to show the public that we do really care about these cultural resources and that we're doing our, our best to bring them back to life. And I was so happy I hugged the stone, okay? So that was actually one of my favorite moments for the Civil War Defenses of Washington. And um, I know that took a while, but you can find us on our, our website. I'm very active on our Facebook page. I, we show a lot of different images and videos and things like that. Uh, we also have an Instagram page. Um, and then obviously you can reach out to the, the members of the, the executive committee. Um, and if you need 
uh, me, if you were, if you want me to present again or anything, I'm at your service. Just let me know. And I'm here to um, answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. One of the series of questions we're getting is about the um, resources that might be available. You know, I, I suggest uh, I have a lot of great information about the defenses of Washington on our website from the engineers, from the soldiers that were um, from garrison there, including the, um, you know, the image that I'm behind actually, I forgot to mention that I, and I do apologize. The image that's my background, that's in DC. I this is my favorite image of African-Americans during the civil war, uh, soldiers. Um, and you see this image everywhere when they talk about African-American soldiers, right? This is the fourth United States colored, uh, colored troops, Company E at Fort Lincoln in oh. November of 1865. Um, so there were a few units of United States colored troops that garrisoned the forts until uh, March, April of 1866. So quite a bit of time, you know, after the end of major hostilities. So, um, and so I mentioned African-American soldiers on the website as well. Um, we also have a historic resource guide that's digitized that I can share with everyone. And it talks about literally everything from who the forts are named after, the landowners, um, the civil engineers, the army engineers, all that information I can share with you. Um, and I'll, you know what, I'll send an email to, to John and to Kurt um, with all the resources that you can look up, okay? And by the way, if you're gonna read about Fort Stevens, especially, you have to read about the Valley Campaign, right? So you have to read about Monocacy, you have to read about the, the light engagement that happened at um, uh, Harper's Ferry near, um, uh, around the 4th of July with Franz Siegel and stuff like that. That all um, affects this campaign. And then afterward, I, I must mention that, you know, the campaign does not end on July 12th. Early marches towards like the Shenandoah River and the Potomac River, but we have the Battle of Cool Springs. I think a lot of people know Jonathan Noalis, who is absolutely incredible with the work he's been doing with Shenandoah University. Uh, and he's the expert on Cool Springs. And so we did a program out there last year for the anniversary, kind of, um, you know, talking about what happens afterward, because who follows early after Fort Stevens? Horatio Wright, the Sixth Corps, the 19th Corps, uh, elements of the Army of West Virginia, and that will form the nucleus, as we know, of the Army of Shenandoah that will be assigned to Philip Sheridan in August of 1864, right? And so... What, one thing I love to say, I'll mention really quickly, Dr. Cooling would always say, for this campaign, it's one evolution after the other, right? You got the val them going up the valley, crossing the Potomac, you got Monocacy evolution, you got Fort Stevens, you have the March afterward, you have Cool Springs, you have the raid on Chambersburg, right? You've got Sheridan coming out, on and on and on and on. It, it really does not end until what, October of 64, into November, so yeah. Well, I'm a volunteer at Monocacy National Battlefield. Yeah, right, right. One of the topics that seems to sort of fall through the cracks is the Lost Brigade. So in your slides, you mentioned rickets, you know, coming in from the Baltimore site. Right, right. Could you, could you speak a little bit to that for this audience that may not know anything about those um, 900? Yeah, Lynn, and you probably know more of this about okay. than me. Um, I, I, you'll appreciate this. I, I was actually talking to Matt Borders last night. Okay. Um, but yeah, so... Ricketts, you know, Ricketts Division had three brigades, and he only read on the battlefield with two. One of his brigades, as Lynn was saying, the last brigade, um, Lynn, I, I, to be honest, I don't remember all the details, but it wasn't the train stopped, and uh, yeah. or they stopped the train, and, and he did not march out to the battlefield, right? Precisely, they stopped at Mount Airy. I mean, there That's was some, some speculation that they had gone as far as Monrovia, but they, they weren't even close to- Oh, really? Okay. Life but, you know, Lynn, I'm sure you guys have thought about this. Imagine what another brigade would have done for uh, Lou Wallace's defense along the Monocacy River, right? right. I, mean, right. He, I mean, they were outgunned artillery-wise, um, which is kind of rare for Union armies during the Civil War, right? Um, and th they're obviously clearly outnumbered. Um, and towards the end of the, that day, July 9th, they were just overwhelmed on both their flanks. Another brigade would have been- um, absolutely critical to the defense. Um, and you know, an important thing as well, Ricketts retreats with Lou Wallace to 
um, uh, to Baltimore. Uh, and actually one of the things that Lou Ross writes, let me read it really quickly. Two fresh regiments of the Sixth Corps are recovering, are, are covering my retreat. I shall try to get to Baltimore. And Lynn, are those two re are those two regiments from the Lost um, the, uh, Brigade? I believe so, right? Um, partly, yes. Okay. okay. So yeah, I mean, so that's kind of an interesting facet. Um, there's also like the Gilmore kind of expedition to Point Lookout to free the prisoners. Like that's kind of an interesting element of the campaign as well. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people know Eric Wittenberg. He's kind of the expert on that. Um, there's been some good uh, articles written about that. If you've ever, but I love going out to places like Port, Point Lookout because there's earthworks out there, right? And really good condition. Um, but uh, you know, the idea was to, to free prisoners, arm them, and then march them on Washington with early. Can you imagine like prisoners of war having the strength <laughs> to pick up muskets and march and fight during the middle of July? I mean, it was it, it was like a crazy plan. And obviously, by the time the you know the federal army heard about it, they had I, I believe they had moved the prisoners. Um, is that right? I believe so. Uh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. A phenomenal presentation, by the way. I, thank you. I appreciate that. Incredible. Um, yeah, I, I'm just kind of blown away by the enormity of the engineering effort and the building effort under, uh, the war is only four years uh, in duration, roughly speaking. Right. And these forts have to be battle, you know, uh, battle ready within that, that time period. The, the, the amount of um, effort, it, it seems um, Herculean, like, like rivals the pyramids or something. <laughs> but remember, I gave you the number, right? 48 forts at the end of 61. By the end of 62, 63, there's 60 forts. By the end of 1865, there are 68 major forts. Okay, <laughs> wow. and then there's also 93 artillery batteries. Um, there's 30 miles of military road. There's over 35 miles of connecting earthworks. There's, I said, blockhouses. Um, they're mounting over 800 artillery pieces, including um, so large, you know, really large guns, of course, uh, field guns, um, even um, mortars as well. Um, I want everyone to write this down, okay? If you have a pen on you, because this is a great uh, this is a great resource, okay? And I, I think for a lot of us, like I, I know Tom Snaringer and Susan Claffey and my friend Matthew Street, we've actually gone trudging through the you know the dense foliage to find earthworks. Um, but we always reference General Barnard, right? The chief engineer. I mean, he's become one of my great Civil War heroes. I mean, the men, uh, the, the gentleman, I mean, the man was like almost completely uh, deaf. And I, I just learned that within the past year and was just incredibly intelligent and did a little bit of everything. In 64, he was assigned as uh, the chief engineer in the, in, the, in the field of the armies under Grant. But anyways, he writes a report on the defense of the Washington and, and, it's, and it's called a report written on, uh, on the defense of the Washington. It was published in 1871. You can find a reprinted copy on, there's my buddy, Tom, on, uh, on Amazon for like, I don't know, 15 bucks. If you want to learn anything about the defenses of Washington, I would get that. Um, you can find uh, versions uh, digitized online, but I suggest getting the hard, I mean, the copy. You can, you know, do bookmarks and stuff like that. It's a really, really great read. Um, and it tells you everything you need to know about the defenses, why they were built, how we designed them. And by the way, um, I was supposed to go to Portugal last year with my friend David Lowe, my um, fellow NPS earthwork geek, and we were going to see the, the, the lines or the defenses of Taurus Vedras, this really famous defensive line built to protect Lisbon during the Napoleonic Wars. And why do we want to see them? Well, they're earthworks and they're in the mountains as well. General Barnard references those earthworks in his report. And you know what he says? Our earthworks are longer. So he was very, very proud about that, okay? So we hope to make it up. And they, they actually have a Taurus Vedras day now. And they have like a, like a, like a, a guided tour and, and, and route you can take. And by the way, so to get back to your question, sir, about the scope of the defenses, I forgot to read this because I know we run out of time. So my favorite description of the defenses of Washington comes from an enemy soldier. And let me read it to you. 
This is about the Battle of Fort Stevens, by the way. This is, imagine arriving to Washington or the outskirts of Washington, you're under artillery fire and you see these really big forts. These <laughs> we found to be very strong and constructed very scientifically. They consist of a circle of enclosed forts connected by breastworks with ditches, palisades and abati in front and every approach swept by a crossfire of artillery, including some heavy guns. That's quite the description, right? Yeah. And who wrote that? Jubal Early. <laughs> who did he write that to? Robert E. Lee on July 14th, 1864. It was two days after the battle. So what an incredible statement, right? Constructed very scientifically. I mean, these are engineers that are designing this, right? Um, every approach swept by a crossfire of artillery. So when people ask, because, you know, one question I get, how many men were in D.C. as Jubal Early advanced towards Washington? A, a part of the northern defenses, I don't think more than 12,000 men, okay? And we have a mix of um, veteran Reserve Corps troops, uh, 100 day National Guard troops, uh, Company K. I think some people have been to Battleground National Cemetery. There's a monument to Company K there. Um, they're um, National Guard troops from Ohio. They're from Oberlin College. They're college students. <laughs> Facing Juba Early's veterans, the people that found right? That's um, amazing. Obviously, the famous battle where they armed government clerks and empty hospitals. Yeah. Right? <laughs> By the way, there is um, a soldier from the 1st Veteran Reserve Corps who is awarded the Medal of Honor for his service on July 12, 1864. Mm. I think yeah, the invalid corps guys were there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The invalid corps. That's right. Um, and by the way, they served from everything I read, they served very, very well during the battle. Um, and then obviously you have the arrival of the sixth corps. So um, you know, early didn't realize how many troops were in Washington, but um the, the defenses um in many ways were a deterrent, right? You see them, you see the guns, you're taking artillery fire, um, you see the how every foot of ground is swept by a crossfire of artillery. Uh, he's fearful if, if he starts crossing across you know, the middle of the field, he's gonna take heavy casualties. So um, yeah, they served their purpose. I mean, they weren't fully garrisoned. And by the way, uh, General Barnard will tell you how many men they needed. 35,000 men to garrison the defenses of Washington, including heavy artillerists, about 23,000 heavy artillerists. These are the guys that are supposed to operate the 100 pound Parrot rifles, the 30 pounders, you know, the really big guns, they're not supposed to leave the defenses of Washington. As we know, in 1864, General Grant, as someone mentioned, becomes general in chief. He'll strip the defenses of about 25,000 men, including um, mostly heavy artillery units. OK, and so that's going to be a really big issue, um, about 9000 infantry and then a few thousand cavalry as well. So that's how many it needs, how many men you need to um really fully protect the capital. So let me give you a couple numbers here. During the Maryland campaign, there were about 50,000 men in DC to protect the capital. During the Gettysburg campaign, even though they sent some troops away, there were close to 40,000 men. I, I, but the number I found was about 36,000, okay? And so that's quite a bit. Um, I mean, they were so low on men that they were shifting troops from the Virginia forts to Northern, I mean, to Maryland, you know, every man count, okay? So gives you an idea. Um, I saw uh, one question about Oliver Wendell Holmes, right? Was he at Fort Stevens? I'm not too sure about that. Um, one of my interns did a research, uh, did a lot of research on him and found that a lot of the stuff was pretty, uh, uh, was apocryphal and was really hyped up by um, his friends after his death, you know? He's the one that was supposedly told Lincoln to get down, you fool. Um, but Elizabeth Proctor Thomas, the African-American woman, apparently told Lincoln to get down you full as well, right? So who knows? Um, I, but I, I say there was many, many people that told Lincoln to get the heck out of Dodge, okay? So um, any other questions here? Marie's specific question was about whether the hospitals at Fort Stevens um, or one of the other forts became what is now Walter Reed. Uh, no, Walter Reed area was mostly just all farmland. It was, uh, it was all rural landscape. That was occupied, um, it was uh, occupied by Early's men. You know, they basically set up, they, they were set up in the field there. Um, 
And so there's going to be some action out there. As I said, that's where they pulled the boulder out to dedicate at Fort Stevens. Um, actually, the hospital was located behind the main earthwork. So if you ever go to Fort Stevens today, if you look, um, if you're looking north and you see the main earthworks, if you look behind you across the street, uh, you're, you're going to see this really big building, stone building there, a brick building. Uh, it's like a school now. Uh, the hospital and barracks were in that location. Um, everything was torn down after the Civil War. So, um, and what's rem re remnant of Fort Stevens? Uh, well, you saw the images I showed from the early 1900s. There was not much. Um, um, and I, I think this is particular, obviously, to Fort Stevens because um, there was this big development that, that, that grew up around it, right? And so the fort itself was quickly dismantled, obviously, as I said. Um, all the, uh, you know, all the wood was taken out and auctioned off. Um, some of them became like kind of like um, refugee areas for formerly enslaved people. And actually, let me read this to you real quick, okay? This is an account, listen to this, my friends, 1869, describing what the defense of the Washington looked like just three years after the Civil War, or excuse me, four years. About two miles outside of Washington and completely encircling the city is a chain of fortifications completely, completely connected by a military road, forming a boulevard, you know, which kind of leads up to Fort Drive, which by the aids of trees and shrubbery judiciously cared for would be equal to the famed drive surrounding the city of Paris. All the fortifications on the north and east sides have long since been dismantled and are um, now either grass grown or leveled with the surrounding earth and completely obliterated by the farmer's plowshare. What a great description, right? This is, um, we have war and we have peace, right? People move on. Uh, land is valuable, right? So the majority of forts will be dismantled. They'll be bowled over. Uh, I think Fort, if you really want to see a great earthwork as a part of the defenses of Washington, go to Fort Jerusalem in Rock Creek Park. And I know I've got a lot of programs out there. The fort is in pretty good condition, uh, nearly fully intact. It was heavily engaged in the Battle of Fort Stevens, so it's got that connection. Um, and the reason why the fort is still around is because Rock Creek Park was established in 1890. If it was not, the fort would be gone. So I do a lot of programs with St. John College High School right across the street. Uh, and they had a connecting earthwork called um, um, uh, Battery, uh, I can't think of it right now. Anyways, um, I've been working with some of the social studies teachers to give tours to their students and stuff. And one of them found an account, I think up to the 1950s, the earthwork was still by the school. And then they finally raised it. They just, they leveled it, right? Same with Fort Reynolds down in Arlington. It's now like Fort Reynolds Park. It's like a dog park now, right? So the majority of the forts were uh, leveled, but I saw, I showed you the map afterward uh, of like kind of Fort Drive. We're actually very fortunate to have what we have, right? 17 major earthworks, a national cemetery. Arlington County has earthworks. Alexandria County has earthworks. And another one uh, county does have um as well. So uh, we'll take what we can get, to be honest with you. Being in a city like Washington, where everything, uh, you know, gets got blown up. I mean, if you go to Arlington, almost all the forts are gone, right? Because uh, you think about how many people live there and how quickly things developed, right? Um, I learned, and I'll say something really quickly. I learned, sadly, that Fort um, McPherson, which was built um, adjacent to the growing Arlington National Cemetery, Apparently, there were remnants of that around until the 1950s and 60s, I believe, at least the 1950s, and it was completely knocked down because they didn't want to uh, memorialize the, the, um, the, you know, the, the Civil War fortification landscape. They wanted to turn it, you know, to memorialize the, the cemetery itself, right? So, um, yeah, you know, it's kind of, kind of giving an idea of kind of what there is out there. Um, I'm going to do... A, an earthworks report for the de uh, defenses of Camp Nelson, which I think are in pretty good condition. Uh, and if you ever make it out here, uh, and by the way, I could come back free of charge and do a presentation on Camp Nelson. Um, <laughs> be happy to be back. Uh, consistent with what you said, recently they discovered a redoubt at uh, Route 123 and Braddock Road that was preserved because it was part of the George Mason University property. Okay. Um, but it's, it's pretty incredible. It's overgrown by trees now, but 
uh, that's been preserved. Uh, have you been uh, task has anybody asked you to look into that particular one? No, actually, I've not. And I, to be honest with you, um, you, you said it's over by a route where? Uh, 123 and Braddock Road. Of course, it's not a DC fort, but it's one that's been preserved just by happenstance because um, George Mason University owned the property and it wasn't, it wasn't used. But it's uh, the northwest corner of 123 and Braddock Road. Oh, awesome. I'll definitely check that out. Um, it's near Fairfax City. Okay, great. Thank you. So someone asked, did Fort Stevens extend on both sides of Georgia Avenue? Uh, no, actually. Um, there's a Grace Episcopal, I mean, there's a church, um, Emory Church right there. That's where the original fort was at, actually, uh, Fort Massachusetts, and then it was expanded west. Uh, but it was built right next to the road for a certain reason. And you can see why the Confederate Army marched right down that road in 1864. I was talking about the Fort Line explosion. I, I had my friend present on that for like the Rock Creek Civil War, uh, actually for a round table at Rock Creek Park. Um, and he told me that the soldiers that were killed in that explosion are buried at Alexandria National Cemetery. So if you're ever interested in going out there and seeing those soldiers, it's from a, a German regiment, I think a German New York regiment. I can't recall the number, but. My question is about the lady whose property Fort Stevens was on. Yes, I understand that Lincoln had promised her compensation. Obviously, he was killed. And uh, I don't know if she ever was properly compensated for her property. Does anyone know? Yeah, the answer? that's a great question, sir. And, and we've... Um, we're learning about Elizabeth Proctor Thomas more and more every day. Okay, and so um, I think, because when she talks about Abraham Lincoln, like, you know, the soldiers dismantle her house and take her property out and they, you know, they build the fort. Um, I'm not exactly sure if that did transpire because she, she makes this, um, she, make, she has this account where um, Lincoln went up and like tapped her on the shoulder and says like, you'll reap a great reward. And the reason why I don't, because I'm kind of looking at time frames here. Well, I don't think that was um, that that might not have happened is because the fort, the original fort was built where the this first church was at. When the church was knocked down, they built Fort Massachusetts. And when they expanded the fort, I believe that's when they went into her property line and took down some of her buildings. Um, and so that was later in, in 1862, maybe even 1863. Um, and I, I think the, I mean, that's the importance of what's going on with this is after the Civil War, she becomes like the local heroine of the Battle of Fort Stevens. Uh, one of the reasons why you see her featured um, in that image with the dedication of the boulder there. And she understands what's going on. And what I mean by that is if she connects herself to Abraham Lincoln, perhaps, you know, she can finally get this compensation for the damage done to her property. Um, and I think that was a very intelligent and calculated way to go about this. Connect yourself to the soldiers um, and the battle as much as you can. Um, as you said, there's some report that said that she was compensated over a over a thousand dollars or something in like 1915, um, and or I, it might have been 1913. I can't recall. It's around that time frame, um, and then passed away and. I've been told that um, her descendants said that she was never compensated. And I believe that to be the case, by the way, that um, they might, you know, someone might have approved the, uh, the claim of damages. And after her death, they might have just kind of like, yeah, all right, we don't need to take, we don't, we don't have to worry about this anymore. And I, I, I think it makes sense because of, you know, her, um, her as an African American woman. Um, because the, the other civilians that filed claims of damages against the government, I've had a lot of friends do research on this. Uh, the number from what I've been told, is about 30%. They've been getting about 30% of their, the damages that they have claimed against the federal government, okay? Um, and which is really interesting. And there's one guy, here's a great example. Uh, the gentleman that owned the property where Fort DeRussi was built in Rock Creek Park, okay? Apparently had 90 acres of land. Um, my friend uh, Bob Bolesky has been doing a lot of research. He has a blog called Bygone Brooklyn, and he talks a lot about this. So I looked this up. He talks about Fort Bunker Hill as well. So look up the blog Bygone Brooklyn um, by 
uh, Bob Maleski, M-A-L-E-S-K-Y. He's like an expert on this. And he found these incredible claims in the quartermaster files in the National Archives in D.C. And so Swartz at, listen to this, at Fort Stevens, 90 acres of property, okay, including, and he, has, he had enslaved people too, I think maybe five enslaved on his property. The army used, listen to this, 88 acres of his land during the Civil War. 88 acres out of 90. You can imagine Mr. Swart wasn't very happy with that. <laughs> and apparently, according to Bob's research, he filed claims twice after the Civil War. Um, and there was like a 15 year like, you know, range between the first time he was compensated and the, the second time he was compensated. But at least twice, um, he might've been, I believe he was compensated um, twice, maybe a total of 30%. But if you were to get some sort of compensation for the government, um, it would be around 30% if you got it at all. But um, back to Elizabeth Proctor Thomas really quick. Um, you know, her legacy is, is incredibly important to Fort Stevens. Because I, I think a lot of people focus on the battle aspect and then, or even the, the Lincoln aspect. But if she did not sell off portions of their land to this preservation group to save the battlefield, we probably wouldn't have any of it left, right? And that was her selling that section of her property to um, have them, you know, dedicate that boulder. And if you go out to Fort Stevens now, there's a plaque on it as well. The plaque was added in 1920 by the veterans of the Sixth Army Corps. And obviously we talked about the reconstruction from the CCC in the 1930s. None of that would have been possible if uh, she did not sell that land to the preservation group. So it's the legacy of, uh, you know, the battle, the, the fort itself is a part of her legacy and we're, we're very, um, we're, uh, we're, we honor it in many ways. Uh, no question, except to uh, say that there's only one fort from the defenses of Washington still in use today. Can, oh, you, tell me, can you tell me which one that is, Steve? Well, it used to be called Fort Whipple, right? Now it's Fort Meyer, correct? That's yeah. correct. Okay. That's where we meet. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, actually, Kim, thank you. Uh, he helped me put something together that we have posted on our website about Fort Whipple and I guess Fort Cass, okay, um, yes. which was nearby. That's um, right. Here's a question I've always had is, and you talked about all the troops that were there to, to defend the, the capital. Was this the result of the fear that existed among the, pe the folks that were in Washington, D.C. about the War of 1812 and what happened to Washington. I mean, they would probably have been very old by that time, but there would have been a lot of people that were concerned about having the same thing happen. Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, Cause you think about Bladensburg and then you think about Fort Lincoln's like right there, right? Or, you know, where, where Fort Lincoln was, uh, was built. Uh, I know there's remnants at the, uh, the Fort Lincoln cemetery, um, you know, it, which they believe to be Battery Jameson. And, and David Lowe and I went out there and we did the map and we actually don't believe it's Battery Jameson. It's probably another auxiliary battery. Um, I think, yeah, um, I think the, it's, it's all political in many ways, right? Can you imagine the idea of the national capital falling to, um, you know, rebels during, you know, this rebellion? Um, that would have been catastrophic in many ways, you know? Um, which makes me think, because. Uh, I think that's a great question in many ways because we read about this a lot when we read about the Eastern Theater and the Civil War, right? Because we talk about the Army of the Potomac, of course, and the commanders always um, had to protect Washington as well, right? That was one of their mandates uh, because they, this was a part of the Department of the Potomac. So if you're really interested in kind of how this really functions, you know, read about the way that the, the, the military departments were organized. Um, and there's a reason why the army or the war department created the, uh, I guess they kind of brought it back to life. The Department of Washington 22nd Corps was organized in February of 1863 because they realized that, um, you know, the duties and the responsibilities of commanders for the Army of the Potomac, they, it just could not no longer function with, with Washington, right? Uh, if you want this guy to fully operate in the field and defeat field armies, you cannot have them, you know, 
sending troops to Washington all the time and things like that. So they formed their own department and corps just to manage uh, the capital, uh, this, uh, really to show you how important it is, right? And so, yeah, um, when you have the army and General Barnard, you're gonna read what he talks about, going to Congress, asking for like an additional, immediately $500,000 to expand the forts in late 1861, right? Um, you know, you have to tell them why, well, the idea of protecting the national capital during the war, I mean, obviously politically, and then I think military wise, right? This is the center of the Union war effort. I mean, the War Department's here. Uh, obviously, the administration is here. Think about all the men and supplies that are going into Washington, that are going out into the field, right? That's a lot. Um, so, and I, I think, you know, you can also look 100 miles away and see Richmond as well. You know, these two capitals are kind of facing each other, right? So uh, the amount of men and uh, material they allocated, as, as we talked about just a few minutes ago, is absolutely tremendous. And I'll, um, I forgot to mention this. According to Barnard, the army cut down 20,000 acres of trees during the Civil War around Washington. Think about what that did, did to the, just denuded the landscape, right? Obviously, because they had to create fields of fire for their artillery pieces. They had to build the revetments and all these other structures, including the magazines. They got wood in them. They're just covered with dirt, right? Uh, barracks, right? Hospitals, the amount of firewood that the men go through. I mean, just think about how much the landscape has changed. So when you see how open those, you know, those forts were and you're looking towards the enemy, I mean, they're open for a reason, right? So yeah, I think the War of 1812 was, was in the back of some people's minds, but I think, um, I think this was even more precarious because you've got Virginia, you've got Maryland, right? And then you've got the Confederate Army that's in Northern Virginia. And so that's one of my really favorite aspects of, the evolution of DC and the forts, because um, as, as I've been really arguing, I, I went to Gettysburg and I talked about the defenses of Washington during the Gettysburg campaign, because you really get to understand like, um, you know, kind of how things are operating with the War Department, with the Army, um, with strategy, because it, a lot of it hinges on uh, DC. Can you imagine if George Meade had 20 or 30,000 more men at Gettysburg? Right, that's a lot of men, but he kept. They kept thirty-five thousand men in the city during the uh, during the battle. Um, obviously, during the Antietam campaign, you can tell George McClellan, "Hey, we're keeping fifty thousand men. About three federal corps were kept in the city at all times during during the campaign." Um, so that just shows you how important this was. And I'm sure this will answer. Um, I'm sure um, a lot of you ha have this question: What would happen if Early broke through? Right. Tom, we talked about this before, Tom Snaringer. What, what would happen if Early broke through? What if the Sixth Corps didn't get there in time? Um, I'm not sure how much he could have done. Um, he would have broken through. I mean, there would have been other troops in the city. I'm sure he would have ransomed the city. He might have burned some buildings down. Can you imagine what he would have done to the federal buildings? I'm sure he might have knocked them down, take as much loot as he can. But he's completely isolated. He's north of the Potomac River and there's a lot of men coming, right? Um, hence why we, uh, we talked about the importance of monocacy as uh, Gail will appreciate, um, as Lynn will appreciate, because everyone thinks focuses so much on delaying the Confederate Army, which I believe is of course important. One full day is huge in determining what happens in DC, mm -hmm. but also Juba Early did not expect to run into the Sixth Corps. <laughs> You know, he's, you know, you're, you're thinking you're going to run into Maryland home guards and, and other troops like that. Um, but no, you're going to run into Ricketts division of veterans and uh, they're going to, they're going to duke it out for eight hours. Uh, that, that's going to kind of change things. Um, I found this, um, I think Dr. Cooling's book might've mentioned it, but when they had that famous council of war at Montgomery Blair's house where they empty his liquor cabinet <laughs> of this very expensive fine liquor and wine, uh, I think he, he gets a report that another Corps has arrived or is coming. That's got to be the 19th Corps. There's no other troops that are really being sent up, right, that are, would be in Corps form. And by the way, I must share this story real quickly. Montgomery Blair lost most of his property, right? It was basically torched by the Confederates as they left town. Um, he was not very happy with that, as you can imagine. He was still Lincoln's um, postmaster general, right? Um, he accuses the army of cowardice 
And he basically said there was no more than a couple thousand troops and the city had 40,000 defenders and stuff. Henry Halleck of all people lost his mind when he heard this through like a friend associate. And he wrote the secretary of war, Edwin Stanton saying uh, he has no idea like what we had to do to defend the Capitol. You know, if he really was really that brave he should have picked up a rifle himself. Um, Halleck suggested that Lincoln cash dismiss him from the cabinet. <laughs> like that was pretty intense, right? Uh, and, uh, Lincoln smoothed everything over as, uh, as Lincoln did very well, right? He's like, I'll be the one making that decision. But that's kind of a, another interesting aspect of it as, as well. And hey, you can go see the Blair Mausoleum over at Rock Creek Cemetery. You know, it's just, just up the road from uh, Fort Totten, so. Uh, real quickly, Craig, I agree with you on Cor uh, Gordon's claim about what became with AU. Um, the idea of seeing the, the Capitol Dome. And I think there was an another account that they went to another, uh, one of those, um, yeah, I, can't, I can't think of the fort right now, but it was by American University. Uh, but Craig, how I agree with your assessment on that one. Okay, question, sorry. Oh, Steve, I wanted, I, I asked this uh, much earlier in the presentation, which forts served for artillery practice? And I'm presuming most of them were all near the mouth of the Potomac if they were along the Anacostia River or they were on the Potomac. But do, do you know which one, one or more served for just routine artillery practice? Um, oh, I, I think almost all of them. <laughs> yeah. all, all of them? Yeah. You know, literally, literally the entire periphery. Yeah, exactly. You know, and so, I, um, I've been doing, I went to the National Archives um, last, uh, well, I guess, well, before COVID happened. Um, and I, during the winter season, just like once or twice a week, to be honest. And I was just going through the records, right? And the heavy artillery guys train, I believe, I, I might've lost my files and forts. I, I believe they fired um, their cannons twice a week. Wow. And so that's quite a bit, right? At least once or twice a week. And um because they had to be proficient in ranging the guns, right? And so what happens, Lynn, and this all makes sense, right? During the early's raid on Washington, they're calling for the heavies to be sent back to Washington because they need the trained guys to operate the cannons, right? That makes a lot of sense. Um, another one of my friend that works for the, the Capitol, uh, he, he, you know, he, did a his, he did a thesis on the defenses of Washington and he's done a lot of research as well. Uh, and, you know, there's accounts of, you know, them targeting like barns and stuff like that. And there's civilians living out there. Uh, so there are civilian accounts like complaining of the soldiers basically firing at them. Um, can you imagine what that would have been like? It must have been absolutely insane. So um, yeah, um, let me get back with you on more of that, okay? Um, I started doing the research on that and I kind of got lost. Uh, it it kind of disappeared a little bit. Uh, and then, but I want to get back to it because I'm, I'm really interested on the heavy artillery units and their service and what they did in DC, right? Because they were so maligned for, you know, for this kind of easy service, but they were, they were designed and organized for that reason, right? Mm -hmm. these, reg these regiments were massive, 1,400 men, 1,600. They never, all, all the companies, uh, they didn't serve together until they were sent to Virginia. That, you know, the companies were sparsed out between the uh, the forts themselves, right? But they were integral to the defense of the Capitol. 20, I think 9,000 artillery, uh, there's supposed to be at least 20,000 artillery guys. That's that's quite a bit. Um, um, let me share something, Lynn, that you'll appreciate, okay? And I think this will be the kind of, uh, the final hurrah, unless there's any other questions. Wow. One of my favorite accounts from the defenses of Washington is on April 9th, 1865. Why? Talk to me. Well, that's Appomattox. Yes. <laughs> so it's, if we, if I had like a DeLorean time machine, I would want to go back to DC in April 9th of 1865. I might have, Tom, you, you might have heard this before, okay? Um, and so after Lee's surrender, uh, Secretary Stanton issues an order to every military installation, academy, fort, camp, whatever, to fire a salute in the honor of Lee's surrender. And there was a very astute person in Washington that recorded what happened. And he said, being in the center of the city, uh, you could hear 
the cannons ring around the city for 20 to 30 miles for hours. Wow. Can you imagine what that would have sounded like? So he's like, you knew what direction they were going, right? Boom, 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 boom. boom. All, I mean, it wasn't obviously every single gun, but at least a couple hundred guns were firing these blank charges every, boom, I don't know, for, uh, for several hours, uh, uh, you know, in honor of this grand victory over Robert E. Lee. So can you imagine what that would have been like? Um, so I, I think about that quite a bit um, because, man, that's a lot of cannons. And he literally says... 20 to 30 miles, you can hear it go around the city. Wow. So that, that's quite something, right? Um, Steve, Steve I, I read that McCausland said he got to Georgetown, but he, since he didn't have enough guys, he, he said, if I had more guys, I'd have taken Washington. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard that as well. Um, I don't know. If you uh, look at that map of Wisconsin Avenue, which would take you right to Georgetown, going to be hard, kind of hard to break through the forts in that sector and there was a lot of troops on that side that was the headquarters of the first division of the 22nd corps under uh, general martin d harden a uh, very uh, battle uh, battle scar veteran of uh, highly trusted um missing a uh, missing an arm that he lost during uh, the fall of 1863 with the army of the potomac I, i've heard that as well that's kind of hard for me to believe to be honest i mean there was a lot of troops in that area um, he would, yeah, he would need a lot of troops to break through. I mean, the idea, can you imagine if you break through George um, to Georgetown, how are you going to get back? Yeah. The other thing I, I heard was that, uh, Montgomery or Preston Blair's mansion, they spared because Breckenridge was friends with his wife. <laughs> yeah, I, I can actually, John, I actually see that as a very plausible. Uh, <laughs> Cause well, you know, no, from his days when he was in, in Congress. Well, <laughs> I, I love the idea of the council of war and what they, those guys were doing and drinking and talking about. Remember on their way, you know, to DC, they, they talked about like reinstalling John Breckenridge, you know, in Washington. And this time he, he wouldn't be the vice president. He'd be the president. Right. <laughs> so it's just kind of this idea is just really, really interesting to me. Um, you know, we're trying to revive the forts as much as possible. Um, because they're, they're really special. You know, you can learn about almost every aspect of the Civil War by uh, going to the defenses of Washington. So I'm at your service. I, I do this, you know, because this is my job and I, I do it for the love of this, of this history. Um, so I'm at your service. If you need, need me for anything, let me know. If I'm back, when I'm back in D.C., if you want to have a personal tour of some of the defenses of Washington, just, just give me a ring. Be more than happy to show you around. It. Can't hear all the clapping, but uh, you you made a record there with the number of attendees, and thank oh, you very much. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful program. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was terrific, Steve. Thank, thank you. you.